place is amazing. Oh, thank you. This is your room. If you need anything, I'll be upstairs. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Miss. Please call me Vera. Hello, I'm Sophia Jessica, and welcome to the Fan Carpet. So it's an honour to have you here, Nigel. You're known for a lot of films. The host being being the most recent. Um, if we go back to the beginning, was there a defining moment for you to get into the industry? It, it's been, I'm of an age, so I have a lot of history. Um, <laughs> when I was 16, I wanted to be a theater carpenter and I was living in San Diego at the time. And I'm working in a place called the Off-Broadway Theater and um, putting together some flats and things. It was dark, uh, Pit Band was playing some, some music. And um, I was able to sing along with them backstage. And uh, just I, when I was growing up, my mom thought I'd, you know, get into singing. I was a choir boy, an altar boy, and all the Irish Catholic stuff. And uh, anyway, so I heard this yell from the from the back of the house, going, "Hey, you!" And I thought I broke some kind of theater taboo or something. And um, it was a guy named Don Wartman who owned the theater and several other things during during that time in San Diego. And he says, I've been looking for a victor to play in Anything Goes with um, with Patricia Morrison and Dean Jones, the famous guy from, from uh, all of the Disney films. And um, it sort of started from there. He said, I'll give you your equity card. And I went from there and I did Lenny with Sandy Barron and Boys in the Band, which was a, a massive hit. Um, traveled around between San Diego and Los Angeles, got into commercial work, and and sort of went on from there. Sort of was a, it wasn't a plan like I want to be an actor. It was uh, I just love the industry, and I do did, did a lot of commercial work. You know, obviously, in on the West Coast is a lot of that. Um, but I got out of the industry I, in the late '80s. I, I left California. I was a little bit disillusioned from a, maybe from a, a spiritual point of view. It, it was never much soul food for me. It was always a hustle. You know, you do 500 sit-ups and you go into a green room and there's 15,000 guys that look better, smile better, bigger teeth, whatever, you know? And it just wasn't about craft anymore. It was about pitch and hype and push. Now, I'm generalizing and I don't want to offend anybody in the industry because I've done some big features in the West Coast and, and I'm very grateful for that opportunity. But from a day-to-day -day nourishment, juicing, soul food, I, I thought Europe was a better place. So okay. I, I, I moved east and uh, haven't stopped since. Um, so what was it specifically about the host um, that made you want to be, uh, be Herbert? I met I'm Zachary, the producer. I'm a great believer in supporting independent filmmaking. I'm a great believer in supporting young filmmakers, grassroots level, because these are the guys are going to turn into the, the the Sam Mendezes and the Chris McQuarries and 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 all these you know the the, the great people, the the Spielbergs, the Lucases, you know. And unless you invest in your youth, this is any industry. I'm not just saying this is about entertainment industry, but unless yeah. you invest in your youth and you sort of give back to them two things you're not involved anymore and and the other one is that I, I think we need to generate support so i do a lot of work with london film school or met in ealing and this i'm speaking I'm, i know you have international um followers here so this is specifically in england and um, i was doing a project uh, graduation project uh, project for the london film school uh seven years ago perhaps and um, it was a Russian director and part of the modules for a master's in, at the London Film School is that each one of the people in the module have to do certain thing, directing, uh, design, uh, production, blah, blah. So it was on that shoot, I think it was called Wheel of Fortune. It was a Russian writer and director. Um, I met Zachary and he was going through his producer's module. And for some reason, because he'd grown up in, in, in San Diego where I, where I spent a lot of time and the, his ethics and his, and his professionalism at a young age impressed me. I mean, I was touched by this guy and, um, we were filming in some really tough environments and he was always there, always supportive, knew to take care of the talent, but then again, always being pragmatic and let's do this and let's do that. And for a young person still in school, he, he had a, a, an age about him, a wisdom about him. 
that I was uh, very uh, impressed by. So when I finished the, we wrapped the production, I said, Zach, if, if, if ever in the future you need somebody like me, you call, I'll be there. So it was like five years later, I get this phone call. Hey, you remember me? Blah, 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 blah. I just wrote a thing in this and I wrote this character for you. Are you interested? And I didn't even, even read it. I said, of course. So that's where this started. Okay. That sounds, that's it was more, more about a connection uh, than the character, you know? Yeah, yeah. For, from everyone that I've been speaking to, from, from the host, and I've actually I've had the pleasure to speak to Zachary as well, uh, but everyone says that it, it's his uh, passion and his impressiveness that drew them to it. It's uh, an inspiration, especially if you're inspired by a younger person. But there's something, just something about his passion that it, it, can't, it wipes off on everybody. And so you're there, nobody on the set, there was no divas. We we're all there with different backgrounds, different ages, different personalities, different craft capabilities and everybody was supportive and it was such a family event without being too interbred you know you need to keep separation especially from character developments and things like that but i just I, I i loved it and what's not to like you know five weeks in amsterdam two weeks in london two of the jewel cities as far as uh, eye candy for film it, it was lovely yeah uh, and and well, after you read the script what was it specifically about the actual story that just that just hooked you made made you realize that you had made the right decision yeah it's it's uh, first of all actors never know right at the beginning that they made the right decision there's too many right. other variables as you know there's direction production value uh, mm -hmm. who's the dop on this what kind of resources do they have there's you, you're never sure um, but as far as the script and the and the, the character and the ability that I had for involvement with developing the character, because Zach had actually written it for me. So he used his knowledge and his memory of me and who I was. And so and then when I met Andy and Zach at, in, in London, um, we just talked about character. We talked about where we're going with this, and it was great. It was uh, it had my name branded right on his butt, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, um, that that's got to be quite uh, quite flattering to have a character written for you, rather than yeah, it, and also a big responsibility. You know, I think I think flattery at, at my level now, in my age in this industry, there's no ego anymore. There's no flattery involved anymore. It's just like we're storytellers and let's t tell a story. You know, we we take somebody else's words and our job is to make it believable. That's all. You know, we're not brain surgeons. We're not political analysts. And anyway, that's a whole nother conversation, perhaps for another interview. But uh, I, I, I was I was. Um, touched by the fact that he did this for me and with that then came the responsibility of having to you know bring him to life the best job that i could in 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 line with supporting character backstories directors interaction with the other characters where they are so because it's a you know a collective collaboration of creatives um that's what that's 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 what's fun you know anybody can sit in front of a camera and do a monologue and mail it off but you know when you've got 30 40 crew and you're on a back loader being driven around in a car <laughs> around amsterdam with with uh with michael playing the lead robert um it, it was it was it was great and and dop's crunched in the front of the car and handheld and that that's that's the joy you know, that's that's making movies. That's telling stories. Absolutely, um, and obviously, um, you spend you spend a lot of times uh, like working with Michael, uh, Mike Beckenham, and um, and Dougie. Um, yeah. How are they to work with? Like like brothers. I mean, absolutely, it was a lot of fun to the point where sometimes that fun was a little distracting. Uh, we would be in a dialogue scene and I'd mispronounce something, a Chinese word or something, and it sort of went off. Uh, they're delightful guys, and I and I couldn't. I mean, brothers, you know. Uh, I'm old enough to be their 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 dad, so it's it was uh, it was great to be involved. Their energy, their talent, uh, enthusiasm understanding of where they were going with their characters it, it was uh, it was very very pleasant but they're they're both dougie and michael for me just solid 
Yeah, great. Um, and, and you've obviously worked with a lot of uh, a lot of top tier talent uh, throughout your career. Um, do you still have a wish list of who you'd like to work with? Ooh, gosh. I don't know. I, 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 I like you said. I've been really, really blessed. I just finished um, a film called "The Sound of Philadelphia" that I played opposite um, Joel Kinnerman uh, from. I don't know. If, you know. You know all the all the films right he's, he's done. Um, killing. Uh, Kill, uh, the killing. It was just called the killing. Yeah. yeah, killing both in the English and the original. Mm -hmm. um, absolute uh, carbon data. The. He did was he was uh, working with Tom Hardy in uh, uh, Child Forty Four with Gary Oldman. I'm mean, just and he's great in Hannah. He's he was great in Hannah. Hannah as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and, great and, and there's a there's a lot out there. I just watched what was it called Run All Night, uh, where he played Liam Neeson's son. Oh yeah, he's great in that too. And it's just like nuts. And 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 watching the stuff now, and then uh, we filmed with him in Belgium. Um, I don't know. I, I don't have this like I want to work with De Niro or I want to work with uh, you know with uh, Pacino or I just want to work with people that give a shit you know and that are not so far up their own ass if I can say that yeah. um, you know that they that they that they don't see what this is all about you know privilege and what a wonderful opportunity to 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 work in an industry that people would give body parts for you know. And then I'm because yeah. I'm so lucky, and and because I do a lot of stage work and I do voiceover work, and, and you know I, I sort of it's such a blessing for me. And I'm doing theater in the West End, and people are complaining that the lift is out or something. And I'm thinking, my goodness, come on, you're 18 year old dancers, you guys can fly, and you're worrying about going up four flights of steps. I mean, it's that kind of stuff. Yeah, but. Um, I've had a, a really, really lovely time. I finished a UK tour, Ireland, Wales, uh, um, Scotland, um, and and England with uh, with Funny Girl with uh, Sheridan Smith, and that was really lovely. Playing Zigfield against her Fanny Bryce, and twenty two different venues all through this wonderful, wonderful United Kingdom we have, and with a history and. You know, and then be able to get off the boards and then go stand in front of a, a television screen and do the the new agent uh, Hamilton from uh, Scandinavian uh, Seymour and TV Four, um, a ten episodic uh, thriller uh, in three different languages, filming in filming in Vilnius in Lithuania, Copenhagen in Stockholm. Uh, it, what's not to like? You know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. Uh, with uh, with film, with like um, acting in a film and 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 your theatre work, do you approach them differently? There has to be there has to be a difference. Uh, the intention and the honesty, no, it still stays the same. Is the character's credible? He he uh, he reacts to what's been given to him. As far as projection of that, of course, you know, in film, television uh, is included in this. The the subtleties, the nuances are a little bit easier read uh, because of the, the the lenses that we have. On stage where you have this thing called the fourth wall that separates, you know, the audience from the performance. Um, now, there are shows that break that fourth wall and they go out and there is interaction with the with the audience. But generally speaking, there's that separation. So it, it, it's bigger. It needs to travel distance but not dishonestly bigger. It's more technique than anything else. And if I've worked on, on a stage piece and then go directly right away into a film piece, sometimes I always get pulled over by the director and said, a little bit too big or, you know, or the other way around. Can you give us a little bit more of that? And it, it, it takes a while. It's like driving in the States and then coming over to England and then going back to the States. What side of the road am I driving on? You know, and once it locks in, it locks in. But, but there is a big difference, but not in the honesty or of the craft. I think it should stay the same. Otherwise, you're dealing in melodrama, you're dealing in in, in genre pieces, uh, Shakespearean or or uh, in some noir pieces, uh, uh, things like that. They have their own brand to it, and this, they people expect you to 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 support the craft in a certain way. But generally speaking, it's all about honesty and storytelling. Awesome. Okay. Um, so, 
you've obviously been in, in involved in a, in a in a lot of projects over the years um are there any are there any genres that you haven't done yet that you'd like to hmm i've done horror i've done sci-fi i've done western i've done thriller i've done musical in film as well um now i just want to work you know i i, I don't uh Sometimes when you're walk, watching somebody like uh, Malkovich or people like that, you be really interested. You get something a little bit dark. I like dark characters. I think they have so many more layers. Um, I play a lot of bad guys, but don't play them bad. They just, just happen to be bad guys from their actions and your interpretation as the viewer, if I'm good or if I'm bad. Mm. But um, not, nothing that... Um, nothing that I'm really like pining for. I just just want to keep working. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and you, you do a lot of voiceover work as well. Uh, yeah. So, do you approach that differently to when you're uh, like uh, when you're at, like on screen rather than just your voice? It, it's even more difficult because if you you have to convey something without the visual, and I think I work with a lot of voices in my time. I think being an actor is is a as an addition to that, not just about having a voice that fits the tone of the product, whether it be corporate or a gaming voice or, or um, narration. Um, and I've done a lot of different things. I've done some big games. I've worked with Smithsonian Channel, National Geographic, BBC Wildlife, those kind of things. But I've also done a lot of sort of quirky things for Ferrari or, or um, Guinness or Pepsi Max or something like that, much more on a commercial level. Um, but I just like it and it's great. And you can sit in your studio in your underpants and don't have to worry about a thing. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, so, um, so like at this point in your career, is there any, any, anything within the industry that you still want to pursue? I'd like to do everything. You know, we're getting, I'm getting to the point now I'm 70 years old in October. And, um, although it's not really making me feel any different because I'm blessed with uh, wonderful genes, my mom passed when she was 104. So if I get some of that, that's great. It's the stigma, the ageist stigma that we have in industry here. They're racist, they're ageist, they're sexist, whatever it is, whether people believe it or not, it's true. And, um, so it may slow me down a little bit as far as parts and things like that. You know, can we afford to, you know, fly this guy over? He's going to have a heart attack. He's going to shit himself on stage or whatever. You know, there's, there's all sorts of concerns, which I understand, historically speaking. But um, for me to be able to keep working until I choose not to, that, that for me is a blessing. Again, telling stories. Love to be involved with a long-running episodic. I think that would be great. Um, where the character can develop and move along. I love British drama. I love British television, generally speaking, apart from the car crash stuff you guys like so much. But that's that's a whole different celebrity uh, uh, thing in itself. But the drama, nobody touches England as far as I'm concerned. The quality of the, the things that are coming out now, and now during this lockdown, we all have the opportunity to really – look at some interesting things whether it be through netflix or any of the other streamers um, amazon prime or mm. even youtube now has their own their own feed market um there's no excuse for not bringing yourself up to speed with what's happening and i always watch something every day that i wouldn't necessarily pick and i'm most often surprised with how good I, it was, you know, that I was entertained by it. So once we start getting a little bit inflexible in our mind, then it follows with our body and we lose that, that joyfulness. I mean, as far as actors, we should be looking through our child's eyes all the time. Everything should be wonderful, full of wonder. You know, whether we look at another person or we see a situation or, you know, once we get locked down to this, predicted behavior i think then we lose our art our flexibility in our craft yeah absolutely um so on that on that point um is there a book or anything um that you're a fan of that hasn't been adapted to film or tv or netflix yet that you'd like to be a part of i've been reading a lot of local uh content uh conrad jones is um written a lot of uh, things specifically in my area where I live up, up Northwest uh, about Liverpool. And um, I, I, re I really like the writing. Um, I like the style, but you know, it, there's been a lot of Brit flicks they call them that have been done. Um, I'm a great fan, great, uh, 
you know, Patterson and all of these people, the thrillers, um, uh, I love them. They're very entertaining for me. And I've been now for the last three or four days, been reading through them as a, a glutton reader, um, these um, short stories that are put together by the thriller uh, writers of America and uh, edited by Kyle Klesler or, or Lee Dalton or any of these people. And there's about 40 different short stories. And I find that's really great because you've got a 10 minute, 15 minute read for each one. And they're just mind boggling. So those treatments in itself, they're, 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 they're lovely. Okay. Awesome. Um, and with the popularity of streaming services like Netflix and Disney plus now in this country, um, what do you think the future of cinema is? After this particular health scare that we were going through this, this pandemic, I think a lot more people perhaps would be um, investing in, in home cinema. But there's also something about going out on a date or with friends and being in this communal environment. Even though the pricing now, I mean, I want to take my, my, uh, my partner to, uh, when I, we were down working down at the Palladium this last summer in London and we had a day off and I said, I'll, I'll, this, I'll take you to a, to a film. And it was like 75 pounds for two people. Even with my senior concession, I said, you gotta be nuts. I could buy a TV for 75 pounds. <laughs> so unless, and it's the same thing in the West End, ticketing prices are ridiculous. I'm sure everybody's gonna make a living. It's a very, very expensive proposition to produce a show, whether it's in theater or it's on the road but you start making it too elite, people are gonna stay home. And now during this lockdown, everything from digital theater to the national theater have been producing this incredible stream online for two or three pounds, and it just makes sense. So I think people with that kind of money is now thinking, let's stay at home. You know, Let's visit England first before we go off to, I don't know, Marbella or any of these other strange places where a lot of people go to on a short haul and let's let's invest in our house let's pay off the mortgage a little bit more bigger screen television let's bring in some maybe I don't know I I, I see uh, holograph projections for entertainment in the not too distant future there's all sorts of things there's still something about though getting that overpriced popcorn, sitting there, complaining about somebody's texting next to you because the light keeps coming on your face. Because um, I'm a Nazi for that, boy. I'll tell you, I want to watch credits. I want to see everything, you know. Um, but yeah. I, I think they, they're going to have to readdress that now specifically. You know, it's, and even if we remove the, the, the expense factor, because what is net cost me, Netflix cost me $5.99 a month. And I'm spoilt for choice because we belong to Amazon Prime. I also get their Prime videos, and they've got some really good content as well. Mm. So yeah, for that kind of money on a monthly basis, you haven't even paid for an adult theater ticket yet. Mm. You know, so something will change. It has yeah. to change. Either we're growing or we're dying. You know, it's basic mm. stuff. And the entertainment industry is a very, very important industry especially at times like this. It's always been that way. We go back historically to the Great Depression in the United States in the 20s and the 30s. Theater, film, you know, the people's soma, to be able to take them out of themselves, to be able to help them lose themselves for an hour, hour and a half, is, is magical. It's medicinal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was re I read I read an article. Uh, I think it was last week uh, that the drive-through in over in America is coming back. So it makes that, it makes sense, doesn't it? Makes sense, yeah, it does. It makes a lot of sense. I work with on on Funny Girl. I posted that she's from Canada, and uh, she said, "What a great idea for a drive-through!" You know. I mean, there was something very romantic about that. When I was growing up in Southern California, you know, that would be what you do. And I had this Plymouth, 1968 Plymouth Barracuda that had this great sloping back perspex boot on it that opened up. And so you'd go in backwards and you put down the back seats and you had your pizza and a couple of beers and a blanket and just, you know. And when I was, during the time that I was involved with, with drive-ins, you didn't have to use that thing that sort of hung on your window the speaker box, you actually tuned into a low AM frequency and it was there. So if you had a sound system as well, it was like surround sound in this contained environment. And that was great. And, but you're still going out with people and that's wonderful. You know, maybe you don't, uh, 
go to the cafe and buy a hot dog and you bring your own food with you, you know, those kind of things. And, and it's doable. The problem with that is land. Land costs a lot of money. And if you think about how much money you make per car and how distance they have to be, and it's all about business. Uh, most of the drive-ins in the United States were in really shit places, like where three or four freeways over, you know, converged and you ended up with this pit of something and they turned into a drive-in. It was absolutely wonderful because the feed market was easy to get to. And, you know, but I think that'd be a good idea. Sometimes weather-wise, I think you'd have a limited trading season, but that's okay too. <laughs> you could always put a tarp up. Uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you could. No blowing. So, what are you looking forward to getting back to once we're allowed to, uh, like, resume some sort of semblance of normality? Everything. Everything. Actually, going down into London and going to a voiceover studio, meeting my people down there, you know, doing an audition in front of real people rather than doing self tapes. Um, having an opportunity to fly to a different country or meet with people and go through a month's rehearsal before you take something on the road, that kind of thing for me. But it's, it's not been a punishment. This has been really, really nice. And I think it allows us to go inside of ourselves rather than outside of ourselves. You know, there's a, a lot of people have benefited from this. A lot of people are paying attention to their health. A lot of people are, are, are um, working on bits and pieces, liaising more with other people, uh, networking because we have the time, bringing all our show reels and our spotlight and our IMDB Pro and all those things up to speed where we hadn't never had the time before. There's something very, very strange. You know, before this all happened, I knew a lot of people would say, shit, if I only had five minutes of my own time, if only I had like 10 minutes just to, just to be with me. And then when it's imposed on you, when it's not your idea, it's like, what is this? I got to do something, you know, and it's just great. And that's, I think if we pull ourselves away from this, there's a lot of things going on. I understand, you know, people are not, not sure because the information that we've been receiving is inconsistent. A lot of people really don't understand how dangerous this viral process is. So when I take my dogs out, I see a lot of people sort of really staying close and having picnics and and you can't blame them with weather that we've been having but but mm -hmm. still it, it it's that old uh, uh, Frank Zappa thing it can happen here but it can and it has been happening and the stress that the NHS has been under and all of the medical practitioners it's 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 a difficult time and I think the least we can do is is stay within the regimes of of, of the suggested restrictions until they're changed. You know, Absolutely. We all want to go back to work. We all want to we all want to you know start making money again. We want to have our reason to exist. Um, get away from the kids because they do <laughs> it for seven for seven months. I mean, whatever. You know, if if uh, I can understand people going, oh, I want to go back to work. This is really tough. The homeschool. Um, yeah, things will change. We'll see. Maybe we'll have a, a whole different thing. I've been watching Zoom broadcasts of people doing classical music, you know, each one of the orchestra, and then some editor puts it, I mean, magical. You know, so maybe maybe that's going to be, you know, our entertainment of the future. Who knows? It'd be great from an actor's point of view because we can stream to billions of people, you know. So it, it's uh, it's it's not bad. It's not bad. Cool. Uh, and just before I let you go, uh, the host is out now. Uh, what are you hoping audiences are taking away from it? Well, I hope they enjoy it. I mean, it's a really a mixed bag of, of uh, thriller. That's some comedy in it. Um, the, the people have been what I've been reading have been sort of it's a homage to Hitchcock and and uh, uh, I, I, th I, th I think it's I think it's an honest piece of, of film. I think it's an honest piece of storytelling the, the eye candy alone the, the the visuals from our locations you know between london and amsterdam are are just gorgeous and and the unusualness the 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 um, uh, the, the script uh, it, it's nice and the personalities i mean working with 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 tom wu from from marco polo series 100 eyes and and um, Togo Igawa from from all sorts of films and Thomas the Tank Engine and you know and 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 uh, you know Dominic from Star uh, Star Trek and I mean it's just it's just been a, a blessing you know Derek Jacobi of course is in it um, yeah. Ruby Turner sang the theme song to it and is in it as well I mean it it really sort of crosses a lot of a lot of uh, uh, 
definitions and and i think it, it therefore creates a, a a wide viewership the the twists and turns and what you get at the end may not be what you anticipated i i, I think it's i think it's a good the, the young filmmakers were involved in this you know from dops to 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 directors to pr producer um and I, I just celebrate, I cannot celebrate them enough for what they've accomplished with that. And we all got on board because of a, of a, of a, of a common love for the storytelling and a respect and love for the production company. And they never once let us down and they were always there for us. And in that environment, uh, what's not to like? Absolutely. All right. Well, um, it's been an absolute honor to speak to you today. Oh, thank um, you for your time with us. This has been great. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, uh, I look forward to whatever you come out with next. It's going to be it's going to be great. And um, yeah, when you're next back in London, let's see if we can sort something out. Take care. If you, if you happen to be able to put up anything, my my uh, uh, Instagram and Twitter, or Nigel Barber Act. Um, and uh, love to connect with with everybody out there. And I only post; I never post what food I'm eating or if my dog was just had a bath. It's only about the industry, and it's only about what uh, what to look out for. So I'd appreciate that mention as well. And thanks very yeah. very much for your time Absolutely. today. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, I'll put that in the lower third for you. No problem. Thank you very very much. You take right. care of yourself. You Thank too. you. Look after yourself. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you for watching The Fan Carpet. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram for more content next time. You didn't choose your opponent wisely. Have a lovely stay. largest of the Balearic Islands, Mallorca. With the turquoise waters of the Mediterranean Sea, beautiful mountainous landscape, the thriving city of Palma, quaint little market towns, a growing number of luxury hotels, it's no surprise that the likes of Audrey Hepburn and Elizabeth Taylor like to holiday here. So come and join me as I take you round Mallorca. Thank you for watching the fan carpet. If you like this video, be sure to click that thumbs up button at the bottom of your screen. And also be sure to subscribe to the fan carpet YouTube channels. They're absolutely free. That's so much fun too. Be sure to check out the official website, thefancarpet.com. Also, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay up to date with reviews, competitions, the latest news, and so much more.